I get a lot of questions about how to like become a successful indie developer or like a rich indie developer or a famous indie developer. I don't know. Uh, I just did what I did and now I'm here. Um, so I don't have answers. I might have some questions for you that might help in finding your own way through this industry. So here we go. So the first thing I do want to remember, uh, remind you, is that this stage works weird. Like, I'm on a stage right now, and that probably makes it seem like I know what I'm talking about. Um, but the honest truth is, I could talk about absolute nonsense, and it would still look smart, because I'm on a stage. As long as I walk around and do this, it looks, it looks smart. Right? I can just I can I can count you through a number of things and it just it would still look smart. So when you listen to somebody on this stage, keep that in mind. That it automatically sounds smart, even though the reality is that some of the stuff they're saying is probably not entirely right, probably not true, probably not right for you. Maybe it's advice from ten years ago. Like I could tell you that when we started, we made freeware games to get famous. I can give you that advice now, but it would probably be really bad advice. So in general, try to pick and choose. Like whoever is on the stage here, whether they're like a hero of yours or somebody who's achieved like great things in the industry or just some random person you decided to go to the talk of, pick and choose your advice. Try and think about what applies to me, how does it apply to me, and if you disagree with me, ignore me. Just, just some dude on a stage. Um, but on the other hand, also, please don't ignore the people on the stage. Listen to them, but like choose. So I wrote a blog post uh, like uh, three or four, four years ago called the uh, Six Stages of Game Development Community Development. There's two times development in there, which makes it really hard to pronounce. Um, and there's six stages. The first one is nobody knows each other. So there's game developers, and they live in different places of a country or a city, but they don't know each other. And then you've got the second stage, which is a local community. So some developers have met each other. They've started to organize some events. They don't go abroad very often, and not a lot of people from abroad go to that community. And uh, that's the most common stage. Like, all around the world, wherever I go, that's usually what I find. Then in the third stage, the members go international. People start going to events like GDC or Gamescom or events like that. And in the fourth stage, one of the local developers from a specific scene, whether that's casual games or indie games or AAA games, they become a hero. They make something that is critically acclaimed, that is commercially successful, they make a lot of money or they get a lot of attention. And at that point, the entire industry changes a bit, because at that point, we've proven that you can make games. And that's different per segment of the industry. So a AAA industry can be super successful in one place, but the indies could be floundering. And in some places, mobile is huge, but nobody manages to make a AAA game. And there's places where there's really only indies, and nobody wants to grow to a AAA studio, nobody wants to try a mobile game. So those things don't grow at the same rate. They're not the same thing. So there can be a hero in one segment and just nothing in another. There can be AAA meetups every week, but no indie meetups ever. Now, when that hero appears, at first, everybody follows them. They try to go to their events. They try to talk. They try to use each other's knowledge, each other's contacts, and that's great. Stage five is a little bit different. Stage five, the industry is thriving. It is successful. And what happens is, people start rebelling against the hero. So if the hero made a casual game, everybody else will try to make an indie game. Like, just like a weird little arcade indie game. And if the hero was trip away, everybody will say like, well, we can do better as an indie. And if the hero is an indie, people will try to grow, become larger studios. And at that point, there's an explosion of creativity, an explosion of directions. Now, there's a sixth stage that I call five plus, because I don't like calling it six, but effectively what it means is that your community has become a global hub. There's very few of those around the world, usually just two or three. 
And most of them happen to be usually in Western Europe or the US or Japan. Now, I have a question for you. Where do you place this community? Which stage? Is it just a local community? Is it an international community? Is it international as in three or four? Do you have a hero? Is there like the big example that everybody follows? So somewhere between like 2.9 and like 3 point something. Okay. You don't have to agree with that assessment, but it's, I, just, I was curious where you saw this community. What I've been, been listening to is it sounds like a lot of this community is high to, so like local communities that have started to reach out internationally, that invite people here. It's big enough to be stage three, but you could easily be a stage four. You have your heroes. There have been very successful studios here. There continue to be very successful studios here. Uh, if you spent five minutes um, looking into the history, there's a history of AAA studios here that have made amazing games, some, some cult hits, some just like big games. Um, and I found that interesting because when I walk around, I usually mostly see one type of game at the showcase. So. I was wondering, if you are in video games, there's really only one good reason to be in video games. And it's not to get rich, because this is a terrible place to get rich, let me tell you that. And it's not to get famous, because even if you get famous inside games, nobody outside of it gives a shit. It's not to, like, there's really no reason except for you like games, you love games enough to spend your day here today in a sweaty room with a bunch of others, listening to some guy on a stage. You must love this stuff a lot to be here. But then I, I wonder, why are you making games? What is, the, what is the thing that makes you love games so much that you're here today, that you spend years of your life getting good at programming, or art, or design? And if you're an artist, you could be an architect. You could be rich drawing buildings. If you're a programmer, you could work in like space engineering, or like, IBM or like a big IT company. It's a more secure job. Better pay, too. If you're a designer, you can work in product design, you can make toothbrushes and earn better than in the games industry. Not even kidding, I checked. So why are you making games? What is your dream game? Why are you here? Like, what are you trying to make? Like, what are you trying to make? Is there anybody here who has a dream game? Just like by race fan, what is your dream game? Yeah. Something like Warcraft, like an RTS or World of Warcraft? An RTS. Anybody else? Yeah, something like Half-Life. Something like Half-Life, big AAA shooter. Like Point-and-click adventure. Point adventure? You too? <laughs> shooter. Anybody else? Yeah? No, nice. So, there's a lot of dream games. I guess all of you secretly have a dream game. Um, you just not, didn't all raise your hand, which is fine. I'm scary, I know. Um, but then I have another question. What is the game you're working on? Like, what is the game you're working on? You're working on an RTS. Sorry? You already made it. Anything else? Anybody else? What are you working on? A point and click adventure. Awesome. You're making small puzzle games. Is that your dream game? Cool. You made a shooter? Nice. So, the people that raise their hands about their dream game, you know why they raise their hands? It's because they're making it. The people that care, usually, that dare to answer this question, are usually people that are either very aware of what they want to make, and they're working towards it, or they've already made it, or they are making it. Now, for a lot of people in the industry, when they join, they have a, a dream. They want to make a thing. And then they start in this industry, and it turns out that that's really hard. I've had a dream game since I was this, this, this tall, and I'm a bit taller now. And I haven't made it yet. It's too big, got scary, scope got out of hand. 
Didn't have the funds, didn't have the team. I tried it once, failed miserably. It's terrible. Well, my programmer left, but then again, I was 16 and didn't pay him, so I get it. So when we joined the industry, at some point, a lot of us lose track of what we love. And when I talked to a lot of the developers here yesterday, that was something that I heard more than once. It's like, well, I wanna make, I, I'm making this game because we need to earn money. And then in the future, maybe I can make my dream game. And I understand, I understand why you would worry about money. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm asking you to make sincere games. To make games that you really care about. Don't make games for the money. And I'm not saying don't care about the money, because money's pretty important. Also, this image is brilliant. I don't know who made that image, but I love it. I found it on Google. I was just like, money, and this came out. So I want to talk a bit about business models, because there's a number of business models that probably won't work for you. So the first one is premium. If you want to make premium games, I'm here to tell you that the average premium game on Steam makes no money, a few hundred dollars. Another business model that probably won't work for you is free to play. There's a lot of companies that are doing free to play and they are better at it than you are. They have more money, the cost per install is ridiculously high, and unless you're very fluent in stuff like DARPU and DARPPU and, and all that, if you're intimately aware of those numbers, if you have inside information on how they work, are you really gonna be like the big free-to-play games of today? Probably not. Another one that's not gonna work for you is ad-based. Because honestly, you're not gonna get the downloads you need for ad-based to work, come on. You know how many downloads you need for ads to pay money? Uh, subscription, probably not gonna work, honestly. Subscription-based games really hard to get enough people to care enough to give you money. And then if some give you money, it's probably not enough to keep them paying money. Uh, business to business, probably not gonna work for you. It's just, it's really hard to get leads and there's a lot of companies doing business to business, outsourcing, stuff like that. Actually, I'm here to tell you that no business model is gonna work, very likely. The honest truth is, game development, very competitive. It's a lot of us. And the honest truth is, if you're in this industry, probably not gonna work out. Now that doesn't matter per se, because you're not here because you wanna get rich. You're here because you wanna try, because you care. And the honest truth is, it's probably okay if it doesn't work out. If you're in the games industry, again, the skills you have are incredible. Whether you're an artist, or a designer, or a writer, or a programmer, and you know what? Isn't it worth trying? Isn't it worth just trying and seeing whether it's going to work? If you love games, of course it is. So I'm not saying leave. I'm not saying give up. I'm not even saying don't care about money. I'm saying if you are making games with the purpose of earning money as your first priority, you're worrying about money wrong. This is not how you make games. This is how you make bad games. So the question I often hear is, what can I make that will earn money? It's a good question. There's a better question though. The better question is, how can I make money making what I want? How can I take my dream game, the game I care about, the genre I care about, how can I make that work for me? Because the honest truth is, if you come to me with a game you don't care about, that you're making for money, I can hear it in your pitch. I've heard 10 of those pitches just yesterday. I hear hundreds of those pitches each month, traveling the world, everywhere, because people are making a game because they've been told that this is how you make money. 
And the honest reality is, you know how you make money? You make money making something you love. And not just that. Make something you love and then think about how you're going to earn money. And thinking about how you earn money doesn't mean I'm going to sell it on Steam. I'm going to find a publisher. I'm going to market on YouTube. Those don't mean anything. Steam is a platform. It's not a wallet. YouTube is a platform. It's not a marketing place. It's not like you put your thing on YouTube and now it's famous. That's not how it works. It's not like you get a feature and now you're rich. That's not how it works. Twitch is not a magic bullet. YouTube is not a secret solution. A publisher is not the answer to all your questions. They're just opportunities. But it's up to you to use them. So the problem, the difference between those two questions is everybody that asks the top question gets about the same answer. Because there are ways that are more likely to earn you money. The problem is everybody knows that. If you know that, it's pretty, pretty possible that the person next to you knows the same thing. So if you all have the same answer, what ends up happening? You all end up making the same game. You want to know what earns a lot of money, what has good opportunity to earn money? A Minecraft game. Pretty good chances. You know what else has pretty good chances of making money? Battle Royale. You know what else? Casual game with animals. I don't know why it's animals, but you put birds in your game, that's 200% up. The problem is everybody knows that. So everybody is making zombie Minecraft Battle Royale with birds. I'm not even kidding. I've genuinely, I've gotten like four emails in the past like three months of people who wanted to make a Minecraft-based Battle Royale. Now the second question is different. Because the second question, there's only one person on this planet that has your answer. And sure, if you take a short version of the answer, an RTS. Right, a lot of people want to make an RTS. But there's only one person who wants to make that RTS. The RTS in their head. Because other people want to make a different RTS. And when somebody says Half-Life, they don't mean Half-Life. No, they have an idea of what Half-Life should be, could be. What they want to change. And that person is the only one in this room who has those answers. So every one of those answers is unique. You know what the biggest problem in the industry is right now? Discoverability. What does that mean? It means that it's hard to stand out. You know what's even harder to stand out? Making games based on the top question. You know what makes it easier to stand out? Making game based on the second question. Yesterday, Callum from Raw Fury talked about how often as a publisher he actually says no. And it turns out it's like 95% of the games that he gets pitched. So when you walk through the showcase here, what would stand out? Casual free-to-play game with birds? Or your dream game? Which would make more people turn their head? Which would get more attention? What do you think? So, here's the thing. The reality is that you're likely going to fail. This industry stuff might not work out. You're here because you care, so that doesn't matter. But if you only get one shot to make a game, if there's this one opportunity to make a game, right? If this is it, you're here now, so that means you had the opportunity to attend this event, you've made a network in the games industry, you've made friends, you've gotten contacts, you've talked to publishers. What if this is your one shot? When you're at the end of it, and this project is over, what do you want to look back on? Pretty successful game, made well enough money, maybe enough to continue, maybe not. And it's a game you made because somebody told you that that would be the best game to make? Or do you want to look back and it's a total failure? 20 people downloaded it. But it's the game you wanted to make, the game you loved, and those people loved it as well. Those 20 people loved that game more than anything else. I mean, both of them are a failure, right? Both of them won't allow you to make a next game. But which one would feel better? 
Which one would you be prouder of? And then, what if it works? Because honestly, you can do everything right, and your game might still fail. You can do everything wrong, and your game might be a monster hit. It's like a gamble. You know how the games industry works? If you do everything right, everything perfectly, you do your marketing great, you get a good publisher, or you go indie, you uh, spent years making this game, but not too long, you're not wasting money, uh, you scope your game right, you, you have the right time to launch, no competitors, it's perfect. You know what happens then? Then you flip a coin. And if it's heads, it's a success. If it's tails, nobody gives a shit. That's the games industry. If you do everything right, then it's a coin flip. If you do everything wrong, you don't even get to flip the coin. So, again, I'm not saying don't care about the money, I'm also not saying give up on practical advice. I'm saying there's something in following your heart here, because that's the reason you're here. And if you're not, then what are you doing? What are you, what are you trying to achieve? Like proving that you can do the thing that everybody else is doing? I don't, you don't need to prove that to anybody. It's not as if when you make like a successful I don't know what what is the like what I see in the in the showcase, and they're not bad games. Don't get me wrong, but when I talk to some of the developers, it's not what they want to be making. So why are they making that? Because somebody told them that's how how you make money in games. You know how you make money in games? Nobody fucking knows. I don't know. My company does really well. I don't know. There's a this publisher guy right there from Tiny Build. You know, you know how publishers work? They work they, and every publisher works the same way. They're taking gambles. They don't have the answer. They have a pretty good idea. They found themselves an audience. They've built an audience around their aesthetic, around their type of game. Tiny Built has a specific type of game. And if you like that type of game, if you like that type of marketing, you go to Tiny Built. And Raw Fury has its own, and Devolver Digital has its own. Flambeer, we're self-published. We have our own aesthetic. If you like Vlambeer games, you buy them with us. You know how we got there? By just making what we love. Because when we make what we love, people know to come to us to get that. So if you're likely going to fail, if you make what you love, then it works out. Then what happens next time? People know you for that game that you loved making. So the next game you get to make can be similar, can be a game that you love. Now, one of the best moments I've had in this industry is this photo. And it's like, it might be hard to see, but that little box I'm holding, that's my video game. That's in a random game store in the United States. I walked into the store, looked on the shelf, and that was my video game. Like right there, in my hand. You know how awesome that is? That's amazing. I spent all of my life wanting to be a developer because when I was a kid, I would walk through the game store as if it was a candy store. Every box was beautiful with colors and games and magic, and I wanted to create one of those boxes. I made it. I made that box. That box, it weighs like 200 grams, and it's the nicest, like, the nicest weight. This, these 200 grams are the work of my life. I spend my entire life working towards being able to hold a game, and I don't think for any future game, it'll stop feeling great to find your own game in a store. And when you think about making games, one of the stories that's always interesting to me is the story of a Canadian game studio called Cappy Barra Games. Who knows Cappy? They did a bunch of big indie games. Uh, they did Sword and Sorcery. Uh, they recently released OKKO. OK um, but they've, they've honestly, they've done a lot of really, really good games. And um, one of the interesting things about them is they are, they are sort of like an indie darling. They're known for these amazing indie games. You know how they started? Started work for hire. They did work for hire for a little just to earn money to make the games they love. And for half a decade, they were stuck doing work for hire because every time they wanted to finish a project, 
they needed to hire more people to finish the project on time. And now they had more people, so to stay afloat, they needed to get a new project. And then they got a new project. But then to get the project done in time, they needed to hire more people, so they got two new projects. Then they had two new projects, so they hired, needed to hire more people to do two projects. Before they knew it, there were 60 people. They couldn't make a single error without going out of business. If they didn't get a new lead, they didn't get a new assignment, a new job, they had to fire 30. And they did that for years because that was what the company ended up doing. Then at one point they said, enough. We're very sorry, we're gonna shrink the studio to just like 10 people. We are gonna make games we want to make. You know what? For a while, it ruined them. For a while, they were gone. From a big studio with massive impact, they went to a tiny studio, just 10 people. And it took them years. But now, they're a big studio again. You know what? Now, every day, they go to work thinking that they get to work on the games they love. And you could argue that, sure, they needed that first money to get experience. They needed those first five to ten years to get experience. There's hundreds of ways to get experience in this industry. If you want to get experience, get a job. Find a game studio. Or work remotely for a game studio. Or go do a lot of Ludum Dare. Or jam on anything else. Or outsource for another company. There's a million ways to get experience that doesn't involve running a studio in which you have to do a lot of the management and effectively end up locking yourself in. So when you make a game, a lot of people talk about making a game, and I hate saying make a game. I love saying make games. And the difference is that games is plural. I don't want you to think about this game. This game, cool, awesome. Sure, it's great. What's your next one? What's after this? How are you going to fund it? Where does the money come from? How are you going to survive between this game coming out and your next game getting underway? If you have enough budget to get to your launch, I'm here to tell you that you are screwed. Because after you launch, there'll be three months before you see your first money. Platforms don't pay immediately. They take months. That's if your game earns money. What if your game doesn't immediately earn money? When it's one of those slow builds, you know? Where like, at first 10 people buy it, and in like 10 months, suddenly it's a hit. What if it's that? It will be a shame if your company goes out of business before those 10 months are over, right? So what's next? And how does this game help you make that game? How does the game you are working on now teach the audience that if they want more of the stuff, that they come to you again? If you are making a cute match two, three, I don't know what game, and what you really want to be making is Half-Life, your audience is going to be very confused when they come back to your studio and they can choose between like Angry Birds and like Gears of War. And those are your two games. What you want to be doing with every game is not just the immediate goal of surviving, not just the immediate goal of earning money, no, the goal of you making games should always be, how does this teach the audience what I am, what my studio is? Because honestly, if you make enough money to survive being miserable making games you don't want, what's the point? Go work for IBM. Earns better. But if you make the games you want to be known for, you think about how you make money, you work towards making money, you take the money seriously, but you work on the games you love. I don't like the saying, if you love what you do, you, ne you never have to go to work, because holy shit, video game development is hard work. But it'll be nice work, which sounds a lot better, doesn't it? One person who said something that I always thought was really interesting is this guy. Um, this guy's Don Baglow. He's a veteran game developer. There's not a lot of game developers in the world that has been, have been in the industry for like 40 plus years. This guy survived in this industry with burnout, with uh, high risk, 
low job security, everything. He survived here for 40 years, 4-0. That's longer than I've been alive. I'm going to guess it's longer than a lot of you have been alive. Not all of you, for which, again, respect, like anybody who's been in this industry for more than 10 years. Holy shit. Um, and he said this, he said, decide, don't accept. And when I thought about it, at first it sounded like a very small, unimportant statement, but there's something really important in there. You know what our job is? There's just one thing that we do in our job all day. We decide on things. That's it. If you're a designer, no can, nobody can give you the answers. How high should your jump be? How many pixels? How many like meters in your physics system? If you say 10, I believe you. I have no idea. I don't have your answers. If you're a programmer, I'm not going to tell you whether you should use an if statement or a switch or a, like, I don't care. I don't care whether you use Unity or Unreal, or you roll your own engine, or you do C++ or Haxi or Flash, or I, don't, I do not care. You have the answer. You're the only one with the answer. Art, you choose your color palette. Want to do bright, cheerful, awesome, dark, grim? Sure. You're making that decision. Business, what platform are you launching on? That's a decision. All that we're doing day in, day out, is we make decisions. There's two ways of making a decision. You make a choice, or you accept. You just accept what the answer is. If you make a choice, it means you've thought about the answer. You've asked yourself a question. What color palette am I choosing? Why? Cheerful? Bright colors? Outlines? Going to use 3D, cell shaded. What are we going to do? If you're a programmer, if you just start writing code, I can reassure you that in general it's not going to be very good code. You spend a moment thinking about the architecture, about how it's going to work, whether you want to expand on it anywhere. You think about the poor people who have to maintain or port it, you know, in the future eventually. You're probably going to write better code. And if you're a designer, if you think about how are people from outside the target audience going to enjoy this game? you're probably going to make a better game. The alternative, you just kind of accept. So if somebody says, what engine are you using? You go on Google and you go, like, best game engine. And then you find, like, 30 forum threads in which people are fighting. Or, you know, when you make a platformer, which direction do you walk? Left to right, right? Why not right to left? Seriously, why doesn't anybody make a platformer that goes the other way? I don't know. I have no idea. I've always wondered why nobody makes a platform that goes from right to left. I only know one. When we at Vinebeer, we made a, we tried to make a, um, a Diablo game just for fun, and um, we wanted to add the inventory system. How many of you have played Diablo? Okay, so the inventory system in Diablo, for those who don't know it, it's like a grid. And every item has a shape. They can be a square, they can be long, they can have like weird curves on them. Um, and basically how you do the inventory is you put the items in there. So if you, if you organize them well, you actually can fit more stuff in there because you have less empty squares. Very clever system, very beautiful, very elegant. And when we were making our Diablo-like, we were having a conversation and we asked like, what kind of inventory should we have? We said, well, why don't we pick the one from Diablo? So we canceled that game three weeks later. You know why? So in Diablo, there's this mechanic called a scroll of identify. Some items you find, are actually, you can't use them. They're like question marks, kind of. They're red. And if you grab that scroll and use it, it kind of like rolls the weapon for you. So you might get like a weapon with like a special effect or like higher damage, or that's when it identifies the item for you. You know what we found in our game? Scroll of identify. We didn't design that, it just came with that inventory. Because when we're thinking about Diablo inventory, why does it work? Well, part of why it works is because there's that risk reward of having a weapon that's currently useless, but might be really good in the future, and that's a really good, clever design thing. But we didn't want that. Our game wasn't complex enough for that. But we just copied it. When we realized we had just copied something without even thinking about it, we just killed the project. And we made a rule within Flambeer, if we want to take something from another game, we don't get to mention the game. So if I want to take Diablo's inventory system to a game we're working on right now, I have to say, well, how about a grid-based inventory system 
where each item has a specific shape, and organizing it in an optimal way will allow you to store more stuff. Because that way, we're not just copying a thing. That second decision to put scroll of identifying there, that was, that was just acceptance. It just comes with Diablo. And a lot of choices you make are just acceptance. And it's not bad, honestly. There are too many decisions to make to really think about every single one of them. It's just too many, every day. You make decisions about what I'm, I'm, I'm making decisions about whether I'm going to take a break and have a sip of water or not. Believe me, I'm not standing here thinking like, should I get a sip of water? I just, I want water, so I'll walk to the water bottle. That's fine. But when you're making games, when you're doing business, when you're doing marketing, when you're thinking about working with a publisher, stop for one moment and ask yourself, is this a choice I'm making? Or am I just going with the answer I've been told? When you start on a new project, stop for one moment. Like, ask yourself, will this fit in what I want to be? Will this be a part of my legacy as a game developer? Will this be something that my future audiences, the people that don't know me yet, will look at my games and go, I want to follow this developer, so that when they bring out a new game, I can give them money so that I can make the next one? So instead of accepting the reality that people give you, the truth that people give you, wait for a moment, decide, don't accept. Now, I have 10 minutes left, 15 minutes left? 10 minutes? Oh, 10 more, okay. Uh, so I've been talking a lot about things I wanted to talk about, and I wanted to leave some slides open for you in case any of you have questions. I'm not really good at Q&A, but I'm, I like, you know, talking. So I was wondering, is there anything you want me to put on like these beautiful empty slides so I can talk about that? Anybody? Let's assume that I had I have a friend who is struggling with a problem, so it may be a little bit longer question yeah. and suggestion for you. But he made a game of his dreams. I mean, he, he had a child, so he left his work, and mm -hmm. he made a game for his child, and it exploded. So he has a company that focuses on games for three to six-year-old kids. Mm -hmm. And those games are getting a little bit more mature as his kids, uh, kid is maturing. And it's more than enough for him mm -hmm. to, to you know, sustain this business and, and do what he loves with his wife. She is an artist. But as soon as he, he, you reach a point where you have your fan base, you kind of start to feel protective about it. And then you see a lot of distractions, especially from big players. So, you know, they have this code of ethics, no in-app purchases, only premium games, etc. And they're changing it in order to survive because everybody else is doing free-to-play. Mm -hmm. And then they have lots of other distractions like going, like big companies have YouTube de deals, uh, content managers, reach content on Facebook. It's nothing like he can sustain mm -hmm. in terms of marketing. But he always gets distracted by this. He is always searching for a way, you know, to mm -hmm. protect what he has. Mm -hmm. So by listening to you, I'm thinking that yeah, the, the, the advice is just continue as it were. But for, for you as a studio head responsible for your people and your brand, you know, how, how do you think people should deal with this kind of distractions? Whoa, that's not the keyboard I want to type in. So that kind of, let's see, is this kind of your question? I think the question is how, if you are successful already and you're mm -hmm. doing your fifth game yeah. and it sustains you, but by, by watching the outside world uh, competition, they're doing the same thing, but mm -hmm. better and bigger games and mm -hmm. getting much more attention and buying a lot of ads. Yeah. And you want to buy a lot of ads. Yeah. Uh, but to do that, you have either find an investor, either find funding, you know. Yeah. So 
I see this as a distraction for the developer right. when he has to stop what he is doing and become, you know, yeah, yeah. a business person. Yeah. I, no, I mean, we go that way, and if not, how to be able to, you know, reject it? Well, there's there's two easy answers: either you don't give a shit and keep doing what you do, or alternatively, find a producer who can do the business for you. Like, there's there's two. If you don't want to do something, there's two options: if you have the money, hire somebody, or don't do it. Like, but again, that's a choice. That's a decision you have to make, and I can't really. Can't really tell you how to make that decision for your company because I don't know, or your friend's company, because I don't know your friend's situation. But there's there's two obvious choices. Like either he just doesn't and tries to move continuing with the fan base he has and the audience he's built, or he finds somebody who loves doing that part of the business, who understands what he's working on, and then works with that person to do the distractions while he focuses on the creative work. Anybody else? Hi. That's he's there's this my comment. I can also just repeat your question, it's fine. So thank you for being in Devgam, traveling to Ukraine. Hope you're doing well. Uh, so you're uh, self publishing games on uh, on Steam? Mostly. Yeah, so I'm assuming you keep an eye on other uh, publishers, on a community, on games that are publishing on Steam and uh, stuff like this. My question is uh, what are the, the little gems that you see that are changing in the Steam community or developers? I'm not talking about like uh, big stuff like Battle Royale, this kind of hype, and small stuff like uh, not successful indie games. I'm talking about like uh, little changes in um, <clears throat> developers or community, it could be positive or negative. Yep. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So what, what are the sub subtle changes in Steam? Yep. Cool. Uh, also, the, I'm honored to be here. Like I've always wanted to come to Defcom and I'm thankful that all of you came out. You've been a great audience so far. I hope you stay with me just a little longer. Uh, any, anybody else? I have a few more slides. Uh, yeah, there's two. Pick anybody. If not a secret, what is your dream game? So my dream game, okay. Um, you know what, I'll make a slide out of that, that's fine. My dream game. Okay. Slide four. Three more. There's one. Uh, Rami, hi. Um, uh, me and my friends uh, tried to enter the game development a few years ago, and uh, we started the game jam uh, to uh, and tried to make a game, but it was too complex for us, especially for uh, just five guys who didn't have any experience. In mm -hmm. it. Uh, and uh, after some, at, at some point, we just gave up. Uh, there was a burnout, and I just kind of gave up on it. Uh, and now I'm like starting over. Uh, it's uh, the new beginning of the past. And mm -hmm. uh, there's still the, the thought in my head. Uh, what if something will, do, will, will go wrong? Mm -hmm. How to overcome this? Uh, what if there will be no, su no success uh, in anything? Yep. Uh, how to deal with it? OK. Uh, cool. Slide four. I have uh, th two more, two more, three more. Yeah. Um, These are <clears throat> I have a question regarding your motivation. Like, um, developing a game can take like one year or two. So, how uh, do you motivate yourself somehow? And if you do, how? <laughs> yep. Thank you. Okay. The last one? Uh, sure, yeah, six is fine. Hi, Rami. Um, Hi. So, um, my question is uh, what to do if I like some genre of games, but I'm not good at it? For example, I like uh, twin stick shooters like uh, Enter the Genjin or Nuclear Throne, but I'm not a professional player. I can beat them. But I like mechanics, I like shooting mechanics, and so on. And I want to make a similar game, but obviously I can't. Yeah. Design it uh, difficulty uh, right so to like uh, 
meet expectations of audience yeah. of these games. So my question is, should I fit uh, an uh, existing audience of such genre, or maybe I should find my own audience, maybe with similar tastes? Yep, that's a really good one. I have, I have technically have one more slide. Is there anybody who really wants me to talk about a specific thing? Otherwise, I just have an empty slide and it's super awkward. Somebody save me. Okay. Oh wait, there was was that a hand in the back because he already has a slide. Sure, like give it give it give it to Alex Rose. He definitely won't have a bad question. Who? Alex Rose, all the way in the back. Scruffy hair. Looks like he's going to make a joke. You've already started dinner. Uh, how instrumental do you think it was to sign with Devolver? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, let's continue this presentation. Hi, I am Rami Ismail, one half of Dutch Independent Studio Flambeer. Um, so one of the, the most common questions I get about game development is how do you balance your creative and your business? And the honest answer is within one person, that's incredibly hard. If you're a single developer, if you're just one person trying to balance those two things, I'm extremely impressed every time I meet somebody who can do that. At Vlambeer, we don't do that within one person. We actually have two people and we made the, the company is structured around one really simple distinction. JW, my co-founder, has full control over everything in our design. He can veto anything I say. If I have an idea and he doesn't like it, it just doesn't happen. Now I have veto over everything else. Production, team, development schedule, programming tools, uh, platform, launch date, marketing, messaging, all the other things. The reason for that is really simple. JW is one of the best designers I have ever met. He's super good with numbers, he's super good at game feel. You can give him an idea and he'll prototype it in 15 minutes for you. And it'll be pretty good. Not always like really good. So actually sometimes it's shit, but like usually it's pretty good. Now, the difference between us is that when JW was young, he found Game Maker, which is a, a really quick prototyping tool. And from his 13th forward, he was a part of this community called the Poppenkast, which was an online community. And they basically challenged each other to really quickly make games. So they'd go back from school because they were all 13. And they'd go like, make a game about a dog chasing a car. Be done by 6 p.m. Now school was out at 3 p.m. So that meant they had three hours. And in three hours, like 12, 15 of them would make a game about a dog chasing a car. And 10 of, them, 10 of those games would be really bad. And two of them would be kind of good. One of them would actually be good. And instead of working on that game that was good, they, the next day they just do a different challenge. Make a game about falling out of an airplane. So they never worked on those ideas. They just, got, they just made ideas, just kept going. Make idea, make idea, make idea, prototype, prototype, prototype. So JW got really good at prototyping. He became a much better designer than I ever could. Because what I did is I found my way into programming and I started working on these really big space sims that took like a year and a half to make. I love space sims took a year and a half to make, and then the guy that I was working with sold them. So I was working on commercial games. I practiced like finishing a game, wrapping it up, marketing, making sure it had a like, good menu, like that it integrated well. So I got good at all the things that JW sucked in, and JW is great at all the things that I suck at. So the most important thing about Flambeer is that we created that structure. I make the calls about the business, he makes the calls about the creative. End of story. There's never any discussion about any of those. Sure, we discussed about design once. We had a three-day discussion about the shape of clouds in one of our games. I wanted them to look like clouds. He wanted them to look like water paint or something. I don't know what he was talking about. I won that one. And sometimes we argue about business. And then we'll have a three-day discussion about what platform we should launch on first. And sometimes I listen to him for three days because I'm not 100% sure and hearing his, his opinion helps me form mine. And then when I have my opinion, I go like, yeah, we'll do what you said. Or, no, fuck it, I'm, I'm doing my idea. And the honest truth is, whether I'm going with his idea or my idea, it's my responsibility. If my choice was bad, that's on me. And I have to fix it. And if a design choice was bad, that's his fault, even if it was my idea. 
If I told them, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have like a really big maze in this level that took 25 minutes to solve and there's no checkpoints, and he goes like, yes, let's do it. That's his fault, not mine, even though it was my idea. So the best recommendation I have for balancing your business and your creative is find the other person. If you're exceptionally creative, find somebody who can do business. If you're really good at business, find somebody who's creative. If you're creative and you're looking for people to do business, you can find a producer that can work with you. You can find a publisher that can take the work away from you. You can do all of those things. If you're good at business, work for a publisher or, I don't know, start your own. I don't care. Now, Steam has been changing. <laughs> okay, Steam is funny. Steam doesn't do subtle. Steam like, is like a sledgehammer for like fixing like a loose tile or something. It's, it's really weird. They're like, this doesn't work. Let's just wreck Steam. I like start over. So at first they had a problem with discoverability, they sort of said, we'll do green light, and then they had a problem with green light, so now they do direct, and in like a year they're gonna get rid of direct because it doesn't work either. The honest truth is, the biggest changes you're seeing in Steam is that developers don't trust Steam as much anymore. So for their marketing, we're not depending on their features anymore. Because honestly, if we were dependent on their features, like they don't work anymore. They're just they're this weird system with like personal recommendations that work for some people and doesn't work for others. And sure, overall developers sell like a small increase of money. But if we can choose between all developers having like a little bit more money, but none of them enough to make a next game, or some of us failing and some of us having enough to keep making games, then I would honestly choose that second one. Because honestly, like people continuing to make games is what what is important to me. So the subtle change in Steam is everything is now outside of Steam. You want to do your marketing? Do it outside of Steam. Twitter? Great for it. Like, look at Ooblets. Tiny little cute game. Only marketing with GIFs on Twitter. Got a lot of attention worldwide. If you want to do a sale, people don't do just sales anymore. Sales are part of like a bigger thing of like an update event or something like that. That is also outside of the game. Because honestly, just doing it on Steam doesn't work. You want to launch your game? You don't launch on Steam. No, you launch simultaneously on Twitch, like Tiny Build it. If you want to know the subtle change in Steam, is like you can't trust Steam as easily anymore. Doesn't mean don't trust them. They're great. They're still a store. They'll sell your game for you. That's awesome. But it's not enough. Just Steam is not your answer. Launching a game on Steam is not a solution. It's just a little step. So the subtle changes are that. So more and more is outside of Steam, and every time a big shift happens between developers, it's because somebody found a good way of doing something outside of Steam. So my dream game was I wanted to make a game with dynamic levels in that I wanted to build an underwater city in a dome, and I wanted to fill it up with water, and that was your level, and it was a small survival shooter. Actually, it's not that far from a Battle Royale game. I just wanted to make it like 15 years ago, and I wanted to add water physics to a game 15 years ago, so <laughs> fuck no, that wasn't happening. Um, I still kind of want to make that game, because I like the idea of fighting in a space that dynamically gets smaller as that dome fills up with water. The honest truth is, dream games are interesting in that they tell you something about what you want to do and what you want to create. And I think what I realized in the, in the long term was the interesting part of that dream game for me is I like putting people together. I like people creating like a temporary world. It's why I like airplanes so much. I like sit next to somebody. If I ch have a chat with the person next to me sometimes, don't even get to know their name. 90% of the time. I just sit next to them and then we chat. Like I had this chat with somebody who was a microbiologist the other day. Super awesome. I taught them how to code, like just a little PHP script. It was an 11 hour flight. They taught me some stuff about microbiology. I still don't know what their name was. No idea. Never find them again. Uh, but I like that while we are in that airplane, that's super normal. And then when the airplane has landed and the door opens, you go like, well, have a good flight. And you just walk away. And that was that. And I like that. And in a way, that's also what I like my games to do. I like them to form little communities, people to like hang out, and then when that community is over, when the game is over, they just all go their own way. Most of them won't stay friends, and some of them will, and that's awesome. So here's a fun thing. Somebody once told me that regret is useless. Now, I don't want to say that regret is entirely useless, but there's a part about self-doubt that's really interesting. Here's the thing. If I give you two options, 
One of them is I give you five dollars, and the other one is I punch you in the face. Which one do you pick? Probably the five dollars. Is there anybody here who wanted the punch to the face? Yeah, of course you do. That's worth more than five dollars to you. Now the truth is that nobody in this room made the bad choice. He just thinks it's really funny to get punched in the face. And everybody else likes five dollars. I don't think there's a single human in the world who, when offered with two choices, looks at them and goes like, this one is the better one, and then goes, let's do the other one. That's just not how it works. Whenever you make a choice, you are making the best choice you can make based on the information you have. There's nobody that has all the information they're looking at and goes like, you know what would be a terrible idea? Doing this, let's do it. That's not how it works. So why would you regret a choice? What is the point in that? What are you going to learn from regretting a choice? The best you can do is learn from it. Maybe I didn't have enough information. But that's a choice. You made that choice at that point, so you can't regret that either. Maybe I should collect a little bit more information next time. Like I should keep pay attention to this. Now that's good. That's learning. That's not regretting. So why regret? Why do people always worry about like making bad choices? You know, they did research the other day. If you have a big life decision coming up, like buying a car or buying a house, they took a group of people and told half of them to make that decision based on a coin flip. You know what they found out? The people who did the coin flip ended up approximately as happy with their choice as the people who didn't. It just, it literally doesn't matter. You know what's interesting about a coin flip? If I have two choices and I don't know which one to pick, I flip a coin. I say, heads is choice A, and coin is choice B. And then I look at what the coin is, and if I'm disappointed, I take the other one. That's it. That's, that's my, that, you want to know how I make decisions at Flamber? That's literally it. I spend the day thinking about it, I flip a coin, I look at it and go, oh, shit, okay, the other one. That's it. And it's the best way of making decisions I've ever found, because that disappointment is the realest possible way I can answer my question. If I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, cool, then I'll do that. But there's no bad choices. People always talk about like making the right choices. No, no, no. Make a choice. That's your problem. The problem is not making the wrong choice. The problem is that you haven't made a choice. You just went with it. You're just like, well, let's do this. That's not a choice. That's acceptance. Decide, don't accept. So yeah, of course, like we all feel doubt. We all think everybody around us is smarter. Everybody has heard of like imposter syndrome. I can reassure you that everybody in this room has like a little bit of fear of everybody else finding out that they suck at what they do. Shit, I feel that way. I have no idea why you all are listening to me, but Alex keeps inviting me, so I must, doing, must be doing something right. But like every time I get on a stage, I'm like, why are all these people here? What are you doing? But you can't let that control you. You gotta trust yourself, and you gotta trust that the people around you wouldn't give you the time or respect you're getting if you didn't deserve it. Like a lot of people say like, well, my friend is so much better, but they're just being nice. Well, either they're a really bad friend because they're lying to you, or you have to have a little bit more faith in your friends. Because honestly, why would they be nice to you if you were like a miserable asshole? I think Callum called me a miserable asshole yesterday. Hmm. Anyway. So somebody asked me about staying motivated. Who asked that question about motivation? Yeah. So it's actually motivation is our biggest concern at Vladimir. When we start a project, it is actually the deciding factor for me to green light it or not. So when we start on a project, we do a JW prototype set, usually in 20 minutes. Then we work on it for two days. Okay. After those two days, if we're still excited about what we're seeing, if it's an interesting nugget, there's something cool there, we work on it for up to two weeks. If after those two weeks, we still enjoy working on it, not we enjoy what it is, we enjoy working on it, then we look into greenlighting it. And if we greenlight it, we don't actually commit to the project yet. For two months, we'll let it kind of simmer. So we just like work on it every now and then in the background, like it's not our main project, but like we kind of work on it. And after those two months, we're still going back to it. That's when we greenlight or not. The reason we do that is because if you, can, if you have like three things to make, money, to make games, you have money and knowledge and motivation. Right? Those are the three things to make a game. Now assume you only get to have two of them. Right? 
So if you have money and motivation, you can hire people with the knowledge. You can hire a programmer, you can hire an artist. If you have motivation and knowledge, you know, that's fine as well. If you have motivation and knowledge, you can make the game for free. You can find a publisher. You can find funds. You can work in your spare time. Now, if you have money and knowledge, but no motivation, fuck no, there's no video game happening. It just doesn't happen. If you're not motivated, no game's gonna happen. So you know what your most valuable thing is? Motivation. It's the most powerful thing in this industry, is that you stay motivated. So if you're ever tired of a game, if you feel a little burnout, if you're a little worried, if you're not quite feeling it, take a break. Just walk away, take a weekend off, go anywhere, just don't touch the game. If you work on a project and you can't find the motivation to be working on it at the start, you definitely won't have the motivation in three months. Val like treasure your motivation. And nobody stays motivated through an entire project. Like half of it is motivation, the other half, discipline. You committed to this in the past. Why did you care so much about this game back then? Sure, you might be demotivated, you might be tired. Wake up. If you're not getting burned out, if you're not tired, get behind your computer, work for a few hours, shut it down. Don't work a full work day if you, if you don't have to in that case. Get a little bit of progress and keep thinking of why did I start this? What, what was I looking for? What did I find here? Want to know a fun thing? I suck at twin stick shooters. Uh, I also suck at lift rousers. I suck at super crate box. I suck at serious Sam the random encounter. Uh, I'm pretty good at ridiculous fishing, but it's like the most accessible game we made, so that's not much of a challenge. Uh, I suck at all of our games. Uh, actually, I ran a game jam a few years ago called Fuck This Jam. And you know what the point of the jam was? To make games in genres you hate. You know why? Because it's the most interesting work you're going to get. If somebody makes a roguelike and they love roguelikes, I know what I'm going to get. I'm going to get a roguelike. If somebody who doesn't like roguelikes is going to make a roguelike, you know what you're going to get? I don't know. That's the exciting thing. No idea. Something entirely new. My favorite thing, a lot of people made race games. Apparently a lot of people don't like race games. I don't know why people don't like race games. There were some really badass race games. There was one company that did a first person shooter and the mechanic of that first person shooter was you had to manually reload your gun. There were like 20 buttons on the keyboard to like take off the safety, take out the clip, put bullets in, receiver, yeah. Awesome game. That kind of stuff, where it's just like, somebody just made something tiny. And you know what the coolest thing was? You would run for a place, there would be this turret shooting at you, and you would hide behind cover, and then you had to like press like 20 fucking buttons to reload your gun while that turret was shooting at you, and it felt awesome. It felt like one of those action movies where the hero's like behind cover, like really quickly doing that. I like getting really good at that in that game just felt awesome, and no game had ever done that. But because some people who don't like first-person shooters made a first-person shooter, they made something super interesting. So. No, making games in genres you suck at, great. Making games in genres you don't like, also great. Nuclear Throne, you know how we balanced it? The first half of the game is balanced against us. And the second part of the game is just like, fuck it, we'll see. Like, just harder. If we can't beat it, it's probably good. Our final boss was, was uh, balanced against JW, should be able to, fix, to beat it. And I should be completely impossible. But I should just never be able to beat it. That's how we balanced that boss. It was fine. It's actually perfect balance, it turns out. Oh, wow, I skipped one. Oh, no, I didn't. Wait. Hey, I forgot what this question was. Oh, yes, signing with Devolver, Alex Rose. Um, so back when Flamberger was young, we, uh, we signed with Devolver Digital for a game called Serious Sound the Random Encounter. They came to us. And uh, they, we, we had never worked with a publisher before. And there was this guy called Nigel who came to us, and he said, we want you to make a Serious Sam game. And we were like, fuck, we love Serious Sam. When I was 14, I loved that game. It's this big shooting game where you run backwards and shoot stuff. Awesome. Um, so I was like, yeah, 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 I want to do But also, they're a publisher. And publisher was a fucking creepy. Like these people in suits that only care about money. Right? That's what I thought. Um, so we said, OK, you know what? I don't want to say no, because I love Serious Sam. But I also don't want to say yes, because they're probably going to rip us off. So here was our plan. We said. What if we pitch them the dumbest idea we can possibly come up with? So Serious Sam is this really fast-paced game about like running backwards and shooting and like things running at you screaming. So we said, well, what if we make a turn-based RPG? 
So it has nothing to do with the game. So we emailed them and we said, well, they are going to say no, and then I can feel good about not having rejected it. But also, I don't have to work for these assholes. Uh, so I got an email back that said yes, and then we had to make that game, um, which we did not expect. It actually turned out pretty good, but we ended up making a turn-based Serious Sam, uh, Serious Sam game called Serious Sam to Random Encounter. The thing about publishers is they're neutral. They're not good or bad. They're not great or like, they're not like just or evil. They're, they're a practical tool. You know how you think of like Unity and Unreal or rolling your own engine? That's kind of like a publisher. You might want to use one because it's a bit easier or it might help you. You might not. There's benefits to having a publisher. There's downsides to this. We worked with Pub Devolver twice, actually. We worked with them on uh, Serious Sound or Random Encounter because they hired us. We worked with them on Lift Routers because I was trying to release Ridiculous Fishing at the same time. And I can't do marketing for two games at once. I'm just one human. So we hired Devolver to do the marketing for that. It was actually great for us. Like I, I would happily recommend for people to work with a publisher, especially if they're just trying to figure out things. Personally, I also recommend people to go through each process themselves once, like do your own console submission, go through cert, uh, deal with you know your platform holders. But honestly, if you don't give a shit, if, if you want to make a creative game and don't deal with the distractions, I'm not here to tell you how to make games. You tell yourself how to make games. I don't have your answers. I just have questions. So for a publisher, look at your game. See if there's a publisher that fits. See if you need a publisher. See if you want a publisher. And if so, go reach out. Pitch. Make games. Thank you. Thank you, Armin.